It's time for the Phil Ferguson Show. This is Phil Ferguson, and you are listening to The Phil Ferguson Show. Show number 421, early mid-June of 2022. Uh, The really exciting thing, just a few days ago, uh, through an executive order, Biden's finally using them a little bit. Um, He is enacting, oh my God, I can't remember the name of it, the Military War Powers, War Powers Act, I think it is. Let's see. Um, anyway, the emergency is to, uh, remove obstacles to allow the United States to kind of jump forward in the production of solar panels. Uh, it may also reduce some of the restrictions of solar panels coming from other countries, which some people are upset about. Fair enough. I'd rather it just be all us myself, but we need to get some freaking solar panels up. We need to get some wind turbines up. Um, solar panels have become fairly efficient. And the nice thing is that, uh, if you put them on your house, they will generally make the most collectively nationally, um, during the day. And the biggest drain on a lot of our, um, electrical systems is in the middle of the afternoon when everyone runs the air conditioners on top of everything else. So it can offset some of those peaks, which is really great. The nice thing about wind is that if you collect wind from enough parts of the country, um, it can be close-ish to uniform. So we still have a long way to go, and I don't know that we get rid of coal and oil, but if we can use 20% less, if we can use 30% less. uh, Actually, me, maybe I'll do a show on this. i got to find an expert. Um, Honestly, I think we should put in some new nuclear power plants. So there. I said it out loud. Uh, But anyway, with this uh, War Powers Act, hopefully we can get some new incentives and some new motivation to put solar panels in more places and produce electricity that is less harmful for the environment and made right here in the United States of America. And one of the biggest drivers for the first Prius that I bought back in 2005. Holy fuck, was that really 17 years ago? Um, I got an 05 Prius and I got mocked from the very first day. Oh, you think that's going to pay for itself? No, I, I didn't. It might actually, but that wasn't the driving goal. For me, the driving goal is to use less of the bad sources of energy, gasoline, to reduce our independ- our dependence on other countries that may want to harm us. And if we can become energy independent, then maybe we can help other countries become energy independent. And then people like Saudi Arabia and Russia can't call the shots when they want to and raise prices on oil. So screw them all. America, America. This is, this should be a conservative thing, right? Power. To, well, it's not really a conservative. The conservatives really aren't conservative anymore. Are they? They're just speaking out the talking points. Like someone's talking about, Oh, the terrible things we're going to have to do to mine lithium in this country. Okay. But what about the terrible things we do to mine oil in this country? Right? So, the, the only way to reduce both of those things is to lo- use less energy. So we should put money towards making everything more efficient. And you know what is dramatically more efficient? A car that moves forward on electricity versus gasoline. Anyway, enough of that. The interview today is with Aaron Ra, and we actually recorded this before this Biden announcement. And him and I just kind of talk about electric cars, some of the pros and the cons, some of the perks, how it works, and some of the negatives. Uh, And I think you're going to enjoy the shit out of it. So it's a little bit of a different uh, format for the show because I just have only a few minutes here of opening remarks because yay me, I'm slammed with work. But we're going to take a quick little break and then Aaron and I are going to talk for quite a long time. I know you're going to enjoy it a lot. Aaron is fantastic. 
and then afterwards I'll have uh, a few closing thoughts and that's going to be the whole show. It's kind of uh, one big topic, uh, Aaron and I talking about EVs and of course a bunch of other random shit just because we like to talk. So that's what we did. So don't go anywhere. Take a quick break and we'll be back with the interview with Aaron Ra. <laughs> Hey you, it's me, Sarah Silverman. You know, lately I've noticed a lot of really sad, really long commercials on TV with like grossy, sick, emaciated people from all over the world. And it turns out they look that way because they don't have food. And I know what you're thinking. If you don't like it, Silverman, TiVo passed it. I did, you still see them. Especially because like, I have a 48 inch plasma high def TV. So every devastating image is in like brilliant, crisp, vivid, like it, like they're in my apartment, you know? So how do I get these people out of my apartment basically? And I think I figured it out. Like all I have to do is end world hunger. And then I'm like, okay, how are you gonna end world hunger? And then it hit me. Sell the Vatican, feed the world. Think about it, we need a hero. And who is more primed to be our hero than the Pope? He's literally a caped crusader. What is the Vatican worth, like $500 billion? This is great, sell the Vatican, take a big chunk of that money, build a gorgeous condominium for you and all of your friends to live in, all the amenities, swimming pool, tennis court, water slide. And with the money left over, feed the whole fucking world. You preach to live humbly, and I totally agree, so now maybe it's time for you to move out of your house that is a city. On an ego level alone, you will be the biggest hero in the history of ever. And by the way, any involvement in the Holocaust, bygones. I know some of you out there are like, well, why don't those bums get a job like the rest of us? Well, did you know that the average Arby's employee in Ethiopia only gets paid nothing an hour because they don't, they don't have one. They don't have one. The bottom line is this, if you sell the Vatican and you take that money and you use it to feed every single human being on the planet, you will get crazy pussy, all the pussy. And I don't mean literally, that might not be your cup of tea. I don't know what your version of all the pussy is, but you'll get all the pussy. Amen. You're listening to The Bill Ferguson Show. Welcome back, everybody, and I appreciate you hanging on long enough to get to this really fun interview with me. I have a good friend of mine, Aaron Ra. How are you today, sir? Um, I'm doing all right, all things considered. X. I, I think, yeah. You still have power down in Texas? <laughs> well, sadly, uh, we, we still have the, uh, the, the leadership Ah. that didn't provide power when it was supposed to and it doesn't seem like there's any recourse all of the people who lied about having upgraded the power grid when they didn't yeah um, no one has been no one has been arrested no one has been fined there's been no news about you know, there's no there's no kind of retaliation or recourse there's just there's just not nothing going to happen to rich and powerful people when they screw up just it just not just it doesn't does occur. sure as fuck does seem like that's the current mode i mean maybe that's just yep. uh the way it's always been but um my wife and i have considered places to move that have zero income taxes because that does sound nice i mean there's always side effects and consequences that may come with not paying an appropriate amount of tax uh but texas is on our list but when i find out that texas loses electricity when it's cold and it loses electricity when it's hot. <laughs> I'm just like, well, damn, yeah, you know, I, I might be compelled to buy me something like a, a Ford F-150 Lightning where I can power my house with my truck. 
Yeah, that was a great selling point when they came up with that because that was that was well timed. <laughs> they were still designing this thing when when that happened, and and Ford says, "Hey, what if we include this? You know, we could we could include this feature, and yeah. boy, won't that sell? Hey, just a little <laughs> extra bit of hardware. Now, I can do that with my 2019 Chevy Bolt with the B EV, um, but it's a much smaller battery, and it's something I would be, you know, aftermarket." kind of uh rigging the car and uh you know it I, I don't know how long it'd last and you know it would easily run a few appliances for a day or two but it wouldn't run the whole house i don't think not for long mm. but uh you know what are you gonna do but but before we have fun with electric cars uh, uh in case just in case one of your listeners doesn't know everything about you tell us about you and your book and your website and uh, what you do uh, well, I don't – right now, the, the only book I'm working on is uh, – I mean, I have a second book that just came out. Uh, my first book was uh, The Foundational Falsehoods of Creationism. That was in 2016. Uh, there's a second book that had just come out from a, a Spanish publishing company. They got a hold of one of my old blog posts, and they said, you know, with this, we'd, we'd like to make this into, a, into an illustrated coffee table book. I'm like, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. So they did that. <laughs> nice. So that, that's technically my second book. And um, there is a third one that uh, that will be out. I don't know. I, I'm not. I'm not sure how I'm going to publish this one. But it, I just finished a years long reading of the Quran, and so I'm going to compile my notes on on my experiences reading through that. And uh, that'll be uh, an infidel reads the Quran. And then we're we're looking at another book that I can't announce yet. Uh, going on the accolades of, of I just finished, I just got notified that I, I have finished the final credits for my uh, Bachelor of Science in Anthropology from the School of Human Evolution and Social Change at Arizona State University's Institute of Human Origins. So I will finally have a degree behind my name, though nice. I'm still waiting for that to arrive. That's a lot of words in there. You know. <laughs> that makes it real. Yeah, yeah. That, that it, I, I hope that that sounds a little better than just, you know, it, just the bachelor's degree. I want all of that other stuff. <laughs> <laughs> what 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 what's the coffee table on? Uh, is it something about evolution? Yeah, it's uh, it it's explaining taxonomy as as I am wont to do. You know, there's so there's this one blog post was explaining why you are an ape and not just an ape, but why are you, why you are a mammal, why you are an animal, why you are a vertebrate. You know, why you are classified as all these different things. I wrote that as a blog post in 2004, and with some uh, modifications or updates it, and, it, and some illustrations, it was published. So, and is that available at the regular sources? I mean, it's, it's supposed to be, uh, although there was there was some discrepancy because they put the illustrator's name as though that was an author and as if I co-wrote it. Ah, so we so we complained about how that was done. You know, the illustrator is not the author. Please fix that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that 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 matters. Well, once that's settled, send me some links or something. I'd love to share it and maybe even get one from my own coffee table. Well, thank you very much. So people complained that it was too short, but hey, it was it was a coffee table book. That's what it was supposed to be. Well, I mean, I think that's the the best of all possible worlds where someone comes and says, "Hey, something you already did. Can we package it up and help you make money with it?" <laughs> <laughs> That, yeah, I'm I'm down. <laughs> yeah, that that sounds really nice. Uh, so, congratulations on that. And the, the regular website is again what phylogeny project? Oh yeah, the, the phylogeny explorer project, which Thank I'm you. currently frustrated with because we've been almost a year offline because somebody had the brilliant idea to to come up with an automated system that would bring in 2.4 million taxa from this other web source, a peer reviewed web source. And it would do that with just a punch of a single button. But uh -oh. we've been a year trying to update the system so that we could push that button. Oh. And for whatever reason, it meant that the entire site had to be offline while we're doing that. And I, I remember when they made the suggestion, I could just in, a, in an instant imagine, and I don't do computer programming at all, but I mean, I could just imagine all of the things that have to be altered so that so that this could happen because it's not like you you say abracadabra i wish for this to be it's not going to be that easy you know there's there's all kinds of little tweaks that have to be made for this to occur i personally would have rather i mean i realized we had only 
with uh, a couple dozen volunteers and over five years' time, I think we had only logged 70,000 taxa uh, in, you know, from citing peer-reviewed sources to do it. Right. So that it would ultimately would be a peer-reviewed uh, site itself. But, and it was it was tantalizing to be able to pull in, you know, a couple mil because that's a that's a profoundly larger number. Indeed. And and it would be it would be great to have all of those end nodes. But I was also interested in the transitional uh, versions too. So I wanted to make sure that those were all in there. I wanted to make sure that there was a tree that we could that people could navigate and be able to use. And for the last year, I've been having myself. I've been having to use like if I want to use illustrations or whatever to to, to show these li- links, I have to use Wikipedia because my own site has been offline. So I have to work with the uh, I have to work with our our engineers about that. And there's yeah. like I said, there's a few of them. And every time we have a talk about this, they say, "Well, this is all you know." computer back end stuff you wouldn't understand i'm like well what i understand is that we're still offline <laughs> yeah yeah I, I i see the back and of course uh you know you, you could always pay them more i guess yeah i how much do, how much a raise do you give a volunteer <laughs> yeah it's a it's a dicey thing well i am so sorry to hear that i i know that the uh the first book that you had come out i i found that it a delightful read highly recommend it um and it's, you know, for someone who knows a lot and or for someone who knows nothing, it's a great and easy read. So thank you very much for that. Um, you have all that. Of course, you have a YouTube channel. Yes, I have been a an activist uh, advocating for secular science education since at least Y2K. And I started on my channel, I want to say around 2005 or thereabouts. Yeah. And uh, I, that that's been that's been fun to do. Uh, and that means that that um, of course you're not just doing science education in this current political environment. That means you have to be a political activist too. No, isn't that awful? Because because you you know that the attacks on science are not coming from just pseudoscientists. They're coming from an entire political lobby that is anti-science. I I know I I got involved with uh, skepticism, um, atheism. I don't know decade 12 14 years ago probably not as mm-hmm. far back as you had started and for a while I, I thought we were making progress and I, I don't think that anymore what, what do you think tell me I'm wrong no oh, I wish I could tell you you're oh, wrong Jesus yeah um, the the sad thing is is it just people keep people seem to be getting dumber I'm, I'm working on a video right now that is addressing a Senate floor hearing that I watched in uh, Arizona yeah. the Arizona State Senate, where all of these senators are talking about how uh, the the Uvalde shooting was caused by teaching evolution. Yeah. And, it, it, yeah, it, and that there is no kind of legislation that will ever do anything yeah. to, to mitigate school shootings, that, that all we can do is turn to God and teach that man was created in the image of God and that that is the only thing we can do to stop school shootings. Yeah, I I was uh, watching some interview of a politician, maybe one of the ones you're talking about, I don't know, and he was asked about, you know, what can they do? And it was a classic, um, oh, what do you call it when you kind of change the subject, I guess, changing the subject. But uh, he said, uh, well, what about all the uh, the black people that are shot in Chicago? No one seems to care about that. That's the guy. Yep, uh, it's uh, what aboutism. Yeah, that's so. Uh, that's what so I was we looking are for. We're talking yeah. specifically about assault weapons. Yeah, and whether there is legislation particularly tailored to assault weapons, like say, uh, whether you have to register it, whether you have to get licensing for it, you know, as a civilian, whether um, whether you can lose your right to have that gun if you if, if there are domestic violence issues in your history, if you have uh, criminal arrests, do you lose your weapons? I mean, Arizona already has that law, yeah, and that that law should be nationwide. Of course, that that law didn't apply in Texas, and I don't know that in in this particular case that there were uh, red flags early enough for for a for a, for that type of appropriate response in the case of this particular shooter in in, yeah. in Texas. But I mean, they they are arguing that there shouldn't be anything pertaining to guns at all. Now we are talking specifically about assault rifles. And whether they should be licensed or regulated, whether they should require training and so forth, not necessarily banning them all, 
I don't personally think that that would be the solution. And I think the reason we haven't already done that is because enough other people also realize that that wouldn't be the solution. Just not an outright ban. Prohibition has a tendency to not work. And, and I'm afraid that that would be the case in, you know, here, I, too, I, I especially they, if, you, if you were to take something like an AR-15 and ban those yeah. when, it, when it's, a, it's, it's not a high-powered round. The, the the rifle that would then step up to take its place fires a thirty out six, and one of those in a school shooting is going to go through five kids. Just one of them. Yeah, it's uh, it's so, one of those things. I I think the easy solution is that we uh, pass a law that says uh, any regulations on guns uh, have to be equivalent to any regulations on a uterus. It's, uh, <laughs> Yeah, it, it, it's funny how uh, the, 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 there's so much hypocrisy when, when is. that is put down, right? I mean, so we, we can we can not worry about other people's fa- safety when it's this thing, but somehow when it's this other thing, well, now all the rules are different because it's all special. Right, and it's all the... Uh, but the what about that this guy is talking about. Yeah. We're talking specifically about assault weapons. Nobody is talking about taking away your handguns yeah. or a- any of your other rifles or what have you, but that's what they got to make it about. Right, so they say that there's there, there's there's uh, all this gun control in Chicago, but not in any of the surrounding states. Yeah, and Chicago's yeah. right near a border. So yeah. it's, how it's easy near a, is it? It's a near a few states. Yeah, it. Yeah, so so it's it's so easy to cross the border with it with a with a gun and transport that in. So what you know maybe we should consider making it national if there is some kind if if there's going to be one thing that applies at all that works in Chicago then it's not just going to be a state within... It's not going to be a yeah. law that pertains only to Illinois and not to the adjacent states. I mean, that's that's just common sense. But, of course, they're not talking about that. They want to do the whataboutism to make it the most... Yeah. It, it, they, they want to exaggerate whatever they can. And then, of course, there's a classic fallback. Whenever you want to do something that you know other reasonable people won't want to do, you can always argue for states' rights. We have a long history in our country... <laughs> Uh, yeah. Of that, and and my my good friend, one of my role models, I say uh, with the greatest of sardonic attitude, uh, Elon Musk recently was complaining about Italy's population shrinking, um, and all the problems. Complaining about a population shrinking. What's that? Complaining about a population shrinking. Yeah, he was complaining about uh, Italy's population shrinking. He actually had mentioned a couple other countries, but when when he mentioned Italy. Uh, had some kind of phrase that, uh, you know, pretty soon there will be no Italy left because if the population shrinks at this rate long enough, and of course the assumptions that merit that mathematical calculation are absurd, um, and whether he knows it or not, this is the talking point that, because I'm a bit of an Italiophile, uh, this is the same talking point that xenophobic racist Italians uh, run out is that mm. uh, you know if we don't have enough babies, the black people from Africa are going to keep coming and they're going to replace us, and there'll be no Italians left. There'll be no Italy left. It'll just be another part of Africa. I have to wonder what what difference do you think it makes if you're not even there anymore? Yeah. Well, so I mean, I mean you're you're going to be replaced by somebody yeah. eventually. <laughs> yeah, right? eventually. I mean, and they have these these small towns in Italy, uh, kind of off our subject, but we're having fun with it, where they. They, you can buy houses for a dollar or a euro. I'll just, I'll accidentally say a dollar. And my wife and I have this running joke that uh, a house that you pay a dollar for is worth it. It's worth a dollar. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and there's a reason that they're trying to make a big marketing campaign. And, um, but often you buy this place in the middle of nowhere. And if your goal is to be on an idyllic mountaintop city, or hilltop city in the middle of freaking nowhere when all the things that entails like no cell service, no internet service, um, limited groceries, two restaurants, but gorgeous views 24 seven. And you have to spend a hundred thousand dollars plus to uh, fix up the house. That might be the right place for you. <laughs> but the reason a lot of people are leaving these places is because it doesn't have those services. It's not going to have those services. It's remote. I'm surprised at people who don't realize that everything is dynamic, that that don't realize that things always change. I know, isn't it weird? I mean, just look at the the demographic. You were talking about, you know, black people will replace us. Well, let's go back 500 years and look at the demographics in this country. 
<laughs> yeah. Know, it, yeah. Some so, people got replaced, didn't they? Yeah. I remember in the seventies when I was a little boy, I remember he- hearing people complain about, uh, yeah, yeah, population and so forth. And, and, and I suggested, well, maybe if, if we're going to have an exploding population, there's too many people. We're not, we're not efficient enough with our food supply. And we have to be very, very efficient to have as many people as we do. We have to, our food production and our power production have to both be very, very efficient. And we're simply not. So I suggested as a little boy, 11 or 12 years old, well, maybe, you know, people should control their reproduction. Yeah. Oh, yeah. man, was I, <laughs> I was demonized by my own family over that idea. I bet I bet you were. And that goes against a lot of successful religions. And, and one of the, the internal memes, I guess, internal ideas that make some religions successful is one, spread it to everybody and outbreed everybody else. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And that, so then there was the other thing that was brought up was the, the, the complaint about I guess not being able to outbreed black and brown people because oh. my, my family was extremely racist. I'm sorry to say. Yeah, I know some. Yeah, but but my suggestion wasn't. I I thought maybe that the problem was was that they're thinking other people are different, and I and I suggested well, you know, the more we intermarry, the more we intermix, the fewer those differences are, right? <laughs> and so you 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 look a few generations hence, and we're all going to look the same. So what's the hell's the big deal? Yeah. And again, I'm I'm some horrible demon to have ever even concocted that idea that it would be okay I'm guess, if we're not white white people. I'm guessing they're not big watchers of Star Trek, huh? I don't understand what's wrong with people. I mean, how do they not know that that languages change, religions change, yeah. that everything changes and it doesn't stop changing. Uh, do you watch a lot of Star Trek? No. Okay. Well, I mean, I I I liked I liked the next generation well enough yeah. back when that was on, but when they came to Star Trek Truck Stop, I stopped watching. <laughs> uh, they've been promoting uh, equality and uh, you know getting along for fifty, sixty years now, and and uh, recently some people have been complaining about that. Now, like, can't it go back to like it was? Oh, oh, you mean when they talked about politics, racism, and. Uh, uh, Kirk was the first person to kick a uh, kiss a black woman on TV, and what a scandal that was! That's that's what you want. I mean, yeah. Uh, but anyway, one of the things I know we, I wanted to talk about, and I wanted to do it with you because you know some things about uh, EVs, electric vehicles, and instead of just me prattling on about it, um, I think you own at least one, right? Yes, and I'm on a list to get another one. Oh, what is what is the one that you own? Okay, the one that I own is the Kia Nero. Okay, I know it. We were we were going to get a uh, a Tesla 3, yeah. but a number of things got in the way. One of them was the $68,000 price tag. Yeah, that's real money. Yep, yep, yep. So, I thought that I was mean, isn't that the $35,000 car? Mind you, uh 0 to 60 in in 3 seconds is kind of something I need in my life. Is it? But it's, but is that worth sixty eight thousand yeah. dollars? And another thing that really got me was that, um, that if you've been inside a a Tesla three, it's not like being in a car, not no. like a real car. Yeah, because there's nothing on the dashboard. There's, there's just there's that no awkward dashboard. screen. Yeah, that that attracts your attention to the middle of the dashboard instead of where it should be. Yeah. And and so you're having to fight with a touch screen, which I hate. Uh, maybe I'm old. I want physical buttons. I want to be able to, to change dials and push buttons that I don't have to see. I uh, I, I tell you, I was in. Well, actually, it was. Uh, I can't remember. I want what. to be able to see where I'm going, and feel where the buttons and dials yeah, are. Yeah, yeah. For, and for be certain, able to adjust them that way. For certain things, and the the two that I uh, I insist on every vehicle, I must be able to turn the sound down to zero with a twist of my index finger and thumb. Yep. Just boom. It happens. It's zero. And I love the tactile feel of going through FM channels uh, or actually even with Sirius when I want to go from uh, 51, which is the clubby dance thing I'd listen to. And I want to go to uh, 122, which is NPR, uh, when there's just a little teeny chiclet on the screen. <laughs> That that you have to push, or you've got to go to another part of the menu, and then you've got to key it in. Or if there's a dial 
I could just spin that around a couple of times. It's so easy. Why take my dial away? Yeah, for me, I just I just kind of bounce back and forth between Ozzy's Boneyard and Liquid Metal. Yeah, uh, yeah. So we're listening except, to almost the same stuff. It, that only becomes frustrating <laughs> when they happen to be playing Guns N' Roses on both stations. Ah, uh, yeah. What are you gonna do? Just, yeah, I don't like Guns N' Roses, and I don't know why. I, I I don't know. I don't know. Well, you, if you knew Guns N' Roses, that would make sense to you. I I, I knew it enough, and I knew it enough. It, that was one of the very big albums that came out when I worked in a record store in a big fucking mall uh, in a record store right next to the food court and it was the place to be which is why the record store was by the food court well they, they often were uh, high priced real estate but you know all the kids had to go get food and so they all had to walk by the record store and that mm. was also the place where I, I learned first learned of Barney it was two weeks before Christmas and uh, some lady comes in and she's like where are the Barney videos and I said, what's Barney? <laughs> <laughs> now, keep in mind, this is almost 30 years ago. And she says, the great big purple dinosaur, duh, and just storms out of the store. And I was so busy uh, I that I was like... I was working at a record store, I'm sifting through these albums. Yeah. You know, so I'm, supposed to, I'm supposed to front the albums. I'm supposed to sort them, make sure that everybody is in their proper location. Yeah. Because, right? you know, sometimes people will mill through and put ACDC in with, you know, the film Harmonic or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, so some things would be out of place, and I happen to be in Neil Diamond. I'm shifting. I'm, I'm sifting through to make sure that these are all Neil Diamond albums, and they're just Neil Diamond's albums. There we go. And while I'm doing that, this woman, and I happen to have my finger on Hot August Night, and I knew that I was that I that I had my finger on that one. You, you couldn't see it because I had all these other albums in front of it. Yeah. And this woman uh, comes up to me, and she's like praising Neil Diamond because she hates that long-haired music. She hates anybody that has long hair. Yeah, so disgusting. Yeah, She's talking you to time. me. Yeah, yeah. So she said, I would much rather have some Neil Diamond. So already knowing which which album is on my fingertip, I pull that one out. And if you've, if you've ever seen it, Hot uh, uh, Neil Diamond, Hot August Night is the only one where he has long hair. <laughs> I guess I don't know my Neil Diamond well enough. And she she gave me a very sour look. <laughs> uh, the the brand new purchase that just arrived in our house is uh, a ten CD box set of ABBA. How's that for something different? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you hear the drums, Fernando. Yeah. Oh, uh, the, uh, I can't my, believe they're still playing. They, they are now. They're doing it uh, with uh, projections virtually. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the new album, actually, uh, if you like ABBA, I mean, if you don't like ABBA, you're not going to like the new album. But if you like older ABBA, the new album is the same style. It, it's actually quite nice. If you like I don't listen kind of, to a lot of not metal. Fair enough. Fair enough. I, I, uh, I have my favorites, and uh, I guess metal could slip in there. I'm not opposed to it, but at least it's not country. <laughs> True. Yeah, that, that's the two types I can't listen to, country and western. I, I love when I get old school blues. Yeah. And and I can listen to old school blues like all day, especially if it's just purely instrumental because blues guitar is just amazing. It's the only time I ever feel like I have a soul. <laughs> very nice, very nice. Uh, I'm going to shift us back to EVs. <laughs> okay. Just so to... one of the things I wanted to talk about, I was going to I said yeah. I was going to buy a new EV and yeah. and my frustration is that car companies are so fucking conservative. Yeah. Yeah, they don't want to do a new idea. They don't want, they'll, they'll only do kind of what they're forced to do, the least that they can do. I mean, look how long we've known that dual exhaust would be the more efficient system, but, you know, you always had one exhaust pipe, two, you know, two pipes come off the headers going into one, and there's so there's mono exhaust. But, you know, dual exhaust is better, it's more efficient, but the co car companies won't make that change, not until something is published where they have to. And so the CEO of Chevrolet, I mean, impounded all of the electric cars at one point because they didn't want to go to electric cars. And the only reason they didn't want to go to electric cars is because they were beholden somehow to the fossil fuel industry. It sure seemed like it. You're talking about the EV one? Uh, I, I don't remember what it was called, what Chevy had. I think it was the Volt or Bolt, one of those. But it might have been a Leaf. I don't know what the, what they called it. But it was it was, it was was early on. Yeah, I mean, if we're talking about uh, 15, 20 years ago in California, that was General Motors and the EV1. 
EV1. Okay, there you go. And, yeah. and like Danny DeVito was a proud owner yes, of one of yes. these things. And, and he, of course, it did have a problem where it only had like 60 or 70 miles of range, but that yeah. was still impressive 30 years ago. Yeah, so I, I, what they can do now with electric motors is just phenomenal. So when my thought, when I saw the when I saw what the uh, the Tesla S was capable of, and this is with all-wheel drive, and it's like 700 horsepower. You remember when we were yeah. in high school, you know, if you had a car that had 400 horses, you'd dominate the streets. I, I could only dream. I mean, I was driving like a Cavalier with, uh, you know, 95 <laughs> to 110 horsepower. Yeah, most of my cars, well, I had Chevy V8s, you know, I, I had Rochester four-barrel quadrajet and headers and all that, but I only got like 325, 350 horses on most of my vehicles. If you had 400, that was a big deal. Um, and now you can get twice that with instant torque. Yeah, yeah, for for an affordable car. And that, and now, so let's apply that to what I currently drive. I my current car, which I love this car. Uh, I, I have a I have a Jeep Wrangler. Yeah, uh, it's heavily customized, as a Jeep should be. They sh they should never be factory original, but 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 mine's got the mean eyes. It's got thirty seven inch tires. It's got five thirteen gears. I took the doors and the roof off of it a year and a half ago, and I just drive it like that. Yeah, and and I love the experience of being out in the wind. I, if I could, I would strip more of it off. I, I, I'd <laughs> like to be able to fold the windshield down and not have a cage around me. That would be cool. I, but so the the if you know, if I could make that electric, and I've talked to five different companies about this yeah about converting my jeep to an ev because i've seen where somebody took a 65 mustang and you know that a 65 mustang if you had a top of the line 65 mustang the most you're going to get out of that with the with the 289 v8 engine that they originally had you might get 200 horses might right <laughs> Yeah, so so it, it wasn't super powerful, but it was very lightweight. They took a 65 Mustang, and they made it EV, put an electric motor in the front and the back, and suddenly this thing has got 800 horsepower. <laughs> it, it, it's a, a 65 Mustang with 800 horsepower and all-wheel drive and instant torque? Yeah. So it, can, it suddenly does 0 to 60 in 3 seconds when the original car, which was fast for its time, is way slower than that. I mean, I, I remember as a kid looking at uh, Car and Driver, I think it was, you know, on Porsche 911 or something where, you know, they're trying to get down to five seconds for the 0 to 60. <laughs> and, and, and now I can almost do uh, 0 to 60 in five seconds in my, my electric Bolt. <laughs> and <laughs> I can almost do that in my plug-in hybrid RAV4 Toyota midsize SUV. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so the, the four-wheel drives, the off-road vehicles, yeah. the thing that they need is torque, right? You don't just need horsepower, you need torque. And if this, these electric motors that have instant torque, they're torque monsters. So if the, with the lower center of gravity that the electric ones have, because you yeah. have to put the batteries on the bottom, you, very, you, you usually will put the electric motors on the bottom. They're like in the axle. Yeah. You can't make the, the center of gravity any lower than it already is. But at the same time, if you put big-ass tires on this thing, like my Jeep has, then it would be a beast off-road. <laughs> it, it, I mean, it, <laughs> it seems like a no-brainer, but it also seemed like a no-brainer that uh, when the U.S. Postal Office orders new vehicles, they should all be electric. I mean, uh, anything that delivery... I was just recently in Italy, and in the cities, almost every delivery vehicle now, already, in 2022, is electric. And it's a yeah. delight. It's a joy. They, they come around. Uh, the biggest problem maybe is that they're silent, uh, especially when you're on streets that are shared by people and cars interchangeably. Uh, it's just kind of how they roll. But um, anything that does delivery locally, I mean, you know, 100 deliveries or 500 mailboxes, how you're still going to do like 10 miles. It, it It's so just easy. Just think about how reliable, I mean, if you've been to, like I was in, I was in London last week. And, you, of course, you get around everywhere on the tube. And yeah. this is a subway system that's run by electric motors. And they've been doing it since the 40s. So these trains move tons and tons of people in rapid acceleration to, to sudden stop, rapid acceleration, sudden stop, over and over and over again, all day long, every day of the week. And reliably, 
yeah. for decades. These are powerful motors, and they just keep running. Now, you put that kind of technology into a car, and that's stellar. Yeah, I, I, it seems like a no-brainer to me. What, what What's holding us back? You, you think the oil industry has got the play, or you just think these big monster companies don't want to change? The monster companies don't want to change. Okay, so look what they, they won't change anything unless they're forced to. So the CEO of Chevrolet, and I've always been a Chevy guy, the CEO of Chevrolet impounds all these electric cars. And then Elon Musk comes around and, and, and forces this company that has performance cars. And now everybody knows what an electric car can do. Right. And nobody wanted you to know what an electric car can do. When the CEO impounded all those cars, there was, a, there was an article in, I want to say, uh, Popular Mechanics, but it might have been, I think it was Popular Mechanics, that was three electric cars that were, that were available. They're all prototypes but they were all quicker and faster than all the Japanese imports. Now, this was in the late 1980s when they advertised this, and this was when the guy decides, okay, we're, we're going to shut all this down. Um, late 1980s, early 90s. Yeah. And, and yeah, and so there's just not going to be an electric car. There could have been. We could have made huge advances yeah, in and, technology and since then, but no, we're not going to do that. The heartbreaking and movie. And so when they finally Go come ahead. to trucks. Yes, they're just not going to do what they don't. They don't do what a truck needs to be. Yeah. Um, so Elon Musk comes out with his truck, and what was and how disappointing was that? <laughs> I mean, please, you, we we have this designed by science nerds or idiots yeah. who have no idea what a truck is or what a what what that there should be creature features that you need to be have some comfort yeah. in the car, you know. Do we actually want things to be tangible? We want door handles. You know what I would like to have? I would like to have an emergency override that if the electrical system fails and the car is on fire, that I can open the door. Yeah, th there are certain things that cars have for reasons. I mean, we're talking about uh, some of the things that don't change, but some things don't change for a reason, like people like comfy seats. <laughs> Yeah, people like to be able to open the damn door with the electrical system. People like to out. be able to open the door, or um, I, I know it's you know every car has problems, but some of the Teslas had problems where the the little outside part where you're supposed to wave your card or your hand by it, and the little handle pops out. Well, if it doesn't pop out, you can't get it open. Um, I think it was was it the Model Y that had the uh, terrible problem in northern climates if you opened the back hatch where all the snow would fall <laughs> into the back hatch of the car. <laughs> uh, and so that wasn't designed, you know. But, you know, you learn those things as a car company as you go along. Um, yeah. But uh, one of the things I think is critically important and confuses a lot of people, and if you don't mind, I'd love to talk about for a minute, charging rate. What, what do you know about charging rate, how fast a car charges? I know that it takes um, that it takes longer to get that last little bit to top off. Fair enough. Then it then it gets to you know you, you can get like eighty percent in, in twenty minutes on some vehicles, but you can't get that last twenty percent. Will take every bit as long as that first eighty did. Now there are some things that people have been doing for workarounds for like high high uh, fa fast charging rates that are comparable with when we're talking about trucks that are comparable with our little Kia. I've made a road trip or two in our, I've made a few now in our, in our Kia and we have to plot out where the chargers are and how long we're going to stay at each one, how long we can afford to stay at each one. Right. Uh, we don't ever want to be at one where we have to be an hour, but sometimes when there's, when we know there's a, there's an empty space ahead of us where, you know, you're going to have to stop and have dinner here while we charge this thing up. Cause we're going to have to go the whole hour in order yeah. to get a full charge, something like that. But it's not, it's not that big a deal. There's, there's, there the trucks I'm looking at, and that's that's what I really wanted to talk to you about today, yeah. the electric trucks, because um, I live in Texas. I've always had to have a truck. I think it's funny when I go to, to London and I don't ever see them. Yeah. You know, it's just it's amazing. How do you guys live when you don't have pickup trucks? Yeah, it's not a thing. <laughs> yeah, I did see one. I did see one. I was at some... I think we went out to Portsmouth or something, and, and it was in one of the smaller towns. I did see somebody had like a Toyota pickup truck. I'm like, so there was one. But, and so, you know, I so always I always have to have what a truck. What EV truck are you thinking about now? Or are you thinking about all of them? Well, there, were, there weren't many options. I didn't like the Rivian just because it, it looks awkward. And I don't think that, the, you know, why, why should the truck, just because it's electric doesn't mean that it has to look stupid. Yeah. Now, I appreciate 800 horsepower and I appreciate its acceleration. Those are both impressive. I'll, I'll give it credit for that. 
but I, I wanted I, I wanted a different kind of truck than un, unfortunately than they make um, not just Rivian but anybody really I a Jeep would not get on the ball they, they, they finally got forced into having to retrofit one of their Wranglers yes. so that they could say that they offer an EV yes however is it the 800 horsepower monster that I want? No. No. No, it's a 225 horsepower. And and like Wh- you said. Why? It, it's like you said that and a lot of this and and GM has this long history of EVs, but you know, with the Bolt in a lot of ways it's like okay, look, we made one. Okay, we we made one. We spent as little money as we could, and of course, when that first came out, the batteries were so expensive that it was hard to make any money. And some companies are like, "Okay, well, we have one, and you know what? We'll we'll learn from that one. We don't want it to sell too many units because it's probably gonna not work out, and it's gonna need repairs and have battery problems." Yeah. Um, and so, that, like like you said, they're being very timid and very coy. Um, but now you have uh, GM as an example. You know, it's talking about half of all of its cars are going to be electric in five or six years, and they well, have they, this, they better have better than that. They have this new platform. Have you have you read up on that? What they can do with their Ultium? I'm just I'm surprised when I talk to people about you know when, for five or six years in the future. Because <laughs> I remember I remember years ago when somebody was telling me that they were working for Isuzu and they were they were in the design team designing new much more efficient internal combustion engines that were going to be coming out in five years. You're like, yeah. And I remember thinking, why are you designing an internal combustion engine for five years from now when everything is going to be electric five years from now? We don't want an internal combustion engine. I don't care how efficient it is. Yeah. We, we're going to want electric. Or, you know, there are some other options that are not strictly electric. You know, like they're, they're, um, there, there's uh, maybe some options in hydrogen and a couple of other things too, but, but not the old-fashioned internal combustion gasoline engines anymore. Stop it. Now, how fast does your current EV charge? You were talking about uh, fast charging. Like I said, 80% in 20 minutes. Do you know the kilowatt rate that what it can charge at? Oh, I wish I could remember that off the top of my head. That's all right. I, yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't remember what I don't know the number, but it, it's probably very close to my Bolt because they're, you know, compadres, these two vehicles. Uh, mm-hmm. Mine is 55 kilowatt is the, the fastest rate, which means, of course, if you charge at 55 kilowatts for an hour, you will put 55 kilowatts of electricity in the battery. And uh, like a smaller car can get four miles or more per kilowatt hour of energy. Yeah, uh, and so you I had st- to drive to I had to drive to uh, I want to what's Colleen, Texas. Yeah, and there were no fast chargers. Yes, anywhere near. So we in, the the earliest fast charger or the nearest fast charger we were going to get is we drove all the way back to Waco, and so you know, we we were staying at this house that just happens to have an outlet out front. So I I plugged <laughs> it into the outlet out front. And overnight, yeah, I was able to put almost fifty miles back on that car. Yeah, that's on not, a, on a on a one ten outlet. Yeah, that's not a whole lot. I mean, but it's overnight, so you could do it. But yeah, it's overnight. But but that gets me all the way back to Waco, don't it? Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> I, I'll take your word for it. I, I I know everything in Texas. When I look at the map, it's only this far, but it turns out to be it's much farther than that. Yeah. So we ended up, we were worried because yeah. we were, we were looking at all the fast chargers and realizing they're all out of what range we have left. Yeah, they're all beyond that. And I'm like, well, fuck, what are we going to do? Well, we, we planned a, a trip from our house to Mackinac Island in the extreme northern part of lower Michigan, not upper Michigan. But that's actually where upper Michigan and lower Michigan and Canada are all kind of in that area. And when we planned our trip three years ago, there was four high-speed chargers along this entire 400-plus mile trip. Mm-hmm. Today in Michigan, because Michigan amazingly did a bang up job with in, in, in installing high speed chargers there's now 30 different locations along this same route that I can stop and the vast majority of them are at gas stations which I'm going to now start calling energy stations so you pull up and often there is a fast food restaurant nearby in case that's what you want to eat you can drive through get your food you pull over you plug in you sit there for 15 20 minutes you eat your food you go into the gas station if you are compelled to buy a four dollar Coca Cola, whatever, and a snack. You come back out to your car. You're ready to go, and you just hit the road again. The the time lost compared to gasoline, 
and it, and this is in my car. Uh, some of the newer cars like uh, Kia, Hyundai, the Ford Mustang, they can charge 125, 150 kilowatts, which is three times my car, where you're starting to get to the point where in 15 minutes you're adding 100, 120 miles of range. And yes, uh, people who buy Teslas and the Tesla S and X and even the Model 3 will tell me Teslas already do that. That's true. It's absolutely true. But it has to be a car that is affordable and available and not $68,000. Um, and we're getting there. We're getting there. Yeah. So I was looking at trucks. Yes. And um, always been a Chevy guy. So while I could see myself getting a Lightning uh, and, and certainly not the Cybertruck, because that was just ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, and, and I didn't want the Rivian because it looked awkward too. So they they come up with the Hummer, the Hummer. <laughs> and now, now when when Chevy did the Hummer the first time, where GMC did the Hummer yeah. the first time, that was so bad. I don't know how it was that that the, the Humvee was ever sold to the, to the U.S. military because it is such a crap vehicle. Yeah, just across the board, everything's wrong with it. It's it's worthless. It looks kind of cool, but that's it from the outside, and and that's it. That's all it had. The only thing it really had going for it was that it had 37-inch tires. Yeah. yeah. That's that's it. And so the one cool thing about it was not replicated in anything else. Nobody makes 37-inch tires. The Hummer was the first and only electric truck that is capable of wearing 37-inch tires. And I'm, I'm assuming you've seen some promotional video of this thing moving around? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I loved the promotional video for it. That was kind of cool. Now, the thing that I didn't like... Uh, for one thing, when you're gonna when you're gonna sell a truck to people, you need you need to think about what why why do people buy trucks? So I've always been like my my family are all blue collar, yeah. So they they're construction workers. They need to they need to haul sheets of plywood. They need to haul sheets of dry rock, sheet rock. I mean, yeah. Uh, you know things like this. I mean, they, those are four foot by eight foot sheets. Yep. You need to have a space in your truck that can carry four foot by eight foot sheets. Yeah, and None of the electric trucks will accommodate that. Yeah, and, and and the Hummer that it I read a really wonderful article. I wish I could remember where it was, but the title of it was a near perfect execution of a vehicle that should never have been built. Yes, <laughs> and, and it weighs almost ten yes. thousand pounds. Well, and and the funny thing is that to me the other thing, and I don't know if you've noticed this in your vehicle because m- mine is a little bit smaller, I think, than yours. Um, the ability to accelerate while nowhere near as fast as some of the other electric vehicles out there, the ability to accelerate is still quite tantalizing. Um, it but goes from zero to 60 in three seconds. The, the, the Hummer, which is pretty stunning <clears throat> when you, when you remember how big the tires are. Yes. Yes. Nine, and the fact that it weighs 9,775 9, pounds. pounds. And the thing I worry about that, and I also even worry about it in my little car, when I'm turning a corner, you know, like I'm on a stoplight and I'm in the right lane, so I can turn right on red in Illinois if there's no traffic coming. And I can turn right, but, you know, half a mile down the road, there's a Wendy's and someone just got their drive through food and they're pulling down onto the road at from the Wendy's. And the last time they looked to their left, there was not a car in sight. And so they start to slowly pull down and they're fucking around with their wallet and their food and their phone and their drink and everything. And they're pulling down on the street and they're okay because there's nobody there. Boom. There I am. Because I can turn that corner and punch it and be to that exit of the Wendy's before they get down the exit. And that's scary enough because my car weighs two to 3,000 pounds. (laughs) But a vehicle that does that and comes out of nowhere and weighs 9,000 pounds. I worry. Yeah. I worry that we maybe should have some kind of regulation about, you know, we already have many rules about what makes a car street legal. Uh, maybe some vehicles that accelerate too quickly or have a combined momentum factor where the weight times the ability to, to go a certain speed in a certain amount of time is too much. But yeah. I, so I, I got myself on the list for the new Silverado. Oh, I think you're going to be happy. Matter of fact, uh, GM just, uh, I just read an article. Uh, they just got a patent on, and I don't know if it'll be in the Silverado. And I don't know, you know, it might not be in all versions where they have just gotten a patent for 
a dual charging system where if you pull up to one of the places where you would normally charge your car, your electric car now, you pull up with the truck. If the one to the left of you and the one to the right of you are both open, you turn them both on and plug one into the driver's fender and one into the passenger's fender and you charge both sides. <laughs> <laughs> now, I like that idea. It doesn't, it, from what I read, it doesn't change the overall maximum charging speed. So if the maximum charging speed is 150 or 175, but if you pull up where the chargers are only 50 or 100 kilowatt, you put 100 on each side, you're going to get close to the 200 maximum without even having a 200 maximum kilowatt charger available. So let's let's look again at the Hummer. Yeah. And remember what the original Humvee was. What was the, the, the what was the selling point that sold it to the army? It was when when the vehicle hits something straight on, the first thing that hits are those giant tires. It's not the bumper. The tires hit first. Ah. So it was able to hit a wall and climb over it. Nobody makes that. Yeah. There's not a car company. There's no Hummer version. They all hit bumper first and they cannot climb walls like like that thing could. But that's what I want. Yeah. And, and if I was to, if I'm if I'm building a truck, I want the tires to hit first. I want I want the the acceleration or the the ascension and and the, the there's I forget what the, the terms are, but the the rates for how, how close you can get to the wall in your front and back tires. How much can you drop off? How how steep a drop off can you get when you're going off road? I want something where I can take the doors off. I, and, and it looks right. It's, it's supposed to be with the doors off. I want, yeah. I want something where I can take the roof off in sections right. or all at once. I want to be able to have what is a fully covered nine-passenger SUV. I want three bench seats, nine-passenger seat belts. I want to be able to fold the back seat down flat into the floor and take the roof off of that part. So now I have a crew cub pickup with a short bed pickup bed. And then I want, of course, you know, the, all of the adjustments that you can do with the bed to make it extended, you know, where the, where the, where the tailgate comes down and becomes an extension bed, has pop-up walls and you know, drop-down seating and all of that kind of work, or drop-down stairway. Then I want to be able to fold the middle bench flat into the floor and take off that part of the roof or button it down to the side so that I now have a single cab long bed pickup truck, just like all pickup trucks used to be back in the 1970s. Yeah, and then I want to be able to take off the whole roof and fold the windshield down in front of me so that I'm essentially in a dune buggy. Yeah, you're not asking for much, are you? Yeah, yeah. That, that's what I, I want. One vehicle that can be everything. And you want it to start at uh, twenty nine nine for the price? No, no, no. I don't <laughs> care about that. What I what I care about <laughs> is the eight hundred to a thousand horsepower. Yeah. I I want I want the torque. I want the capability. I want the I want the stupefying acceleration, and I want the ability to climb shit. Yeah. Yeah, but but what are they making? They're making the same old truck. It's just the electric version of it. And the, irri the irritating thing is that they're all all of them are uh, for the Chevys. They're all 510 horsepower. Now that's that's impressive if yeah. you came from an era where 400 horses was a big damn deal. But we're in the electric motor market now. I mean, you do so much better than that. If you have the what the I don't know what is the, the watts to freedom or whatever stupid thing that they have where you have to sit there and wait for a moment for the battery to heat up so that you get the extra power, then you can get 664 horses. And that annoyed me too. Come on, Chevy, you couldn't get two more ponies out of that? <laughs> yeah, it's funny because uh, some people had hypothesized that uh, Chevy, almost every one of their specs is just one little tweak better than everything on the Ford F-150 Lightning. Mm -hmm. uh, but what Ford had done, apparently, to be clever is they had undersold, and so now they're over-delivering, uh, which is the opposite of Tesla. Uh, so Ford promised X amount of horsepower, where it's more. They promised this acceleration, and it's more. Um, so every little thing now they're competing with or beating what is going to be in the Silverado. So I'm waiting to see if Chevy is going to tweak up the numbers on their release. Um, you can get anything else. You want to get out and get a Dodge Demon. You can pay extra to have that thing super amped, so that you so that you you have eight hundred some odd horsepower, so you can have a, a zero to sixty in three seconds. You know, you can do all of this. You get that with a Dodge Demon, with a, any internal combustion engine. You get a Corvette ZR1. You can then go over to Hennessy and have them customize it. And now suddenly it'll go two hundred miles an hour, where where Chevy wouldn't make it go two hundred miles yeah. an hour, but but Hennessy will make your your Chevy. <laughs> 
Corvette, go 200 miles an hour. Who do you turn to when you, you don't want 664? Why would they make it 664? Come on, we know that we, everybody wants 666 horsepower. Yeah. That would Give be, us demonic horsepower. That That's would what be we want. impressive. <laughs> well, Aaron, give I'm gonna, us the number of the beast. Damn it! Yep, I'm going to wrap up. Is there any uh, last things that people should know about you? Where they can find you? Contact you? What books should they read? That kind of stuff. <laughs> uh, how do how do people contact? Well, my my channel is A R O N R A, just just my name and uh, my Patreon, of course, at patreon.com forward slash A R O N R A. I need all the support I can get. So, uh, you know, everything that I do, uh, honestly, is, is supported by Patreon. I like it. I appreciate you coming on the show very much. Thank you very much, sir. Jesus had a tough life. Boy. I read about that guy. Jesus is the only guy that ever came back from the dead that didn't scare the fuck out of everybody, man. <laughs> He's the only guy that ever crawled out of a grave where people didn't go, oh, ah! I saw some fucker crawl out of his grave! <laughs> Jesus comes back, he doesn't get any pressure, no static, nobody's upset. He climbs out, he's walking around, nobody's upset. They can eat with him and everything, <laughs> you know? It's like, isn't that guy dead? Yeah, but he's real stubborn, man, he won't accept it. Pass the butter. But... <laughs> what are they staring at? Ah, yeah, yeah, I read it, folks. I read that book. He's on the cross. There's 30, 40 Christians standing around going, it's a shame that he has to die. And Jesus is going, well, maybe I wouldn't have to. Let me get a ladder and a pair of pliers. I don't know if Jesus has actually spoken in an audible voice to anybody in about 2,000 years, folks. I think his last words may have been, Oh, ah! Oh, not the other! Oh, you jerk! Oh, ah! It may have been his last words. I'm not sure. Yeah, people say, You think Jesus is coming back? Sure. Sure. What's it been? What's it been? 2,000 years? Boy, I sure don't want to dampen anybody's optimism here. It's only 2,000 fucking years. Yeah, he's coming back. He's going to do game shows. We're going to go, Jesus, this is your life. Remember this noise? Yeah. All right, don't tell me. Don't tell me. Give me a second. He's up in heaven right now. They're going, why don't you go back down to earth? Be a symbol of peace and love to the world. Help. He's going, yeah. Yeah. Sure. Help, huh? Yeah. Yeah, I'd like to help. Tell him I'll be there as soon as I can play the piano again. Thanks a lot. I mean, the only shame that can use his hand is a fucking whistle. Pace e lunga vita. Lunga vita e prosperità. You're listening to the Bill Ferguson Show. Again, of course, I'd like to thank Aaron for his time. I appreciate it very much. And of course, all of the work he has done for like two decades um, in the secular movement, in the science uh, movement, to try to push forward reason and skepticism and objectivity and science for everybody's benefit. So, Aaron, thank you for that. Uh, one of the things we, we danced around a little bit and I wanted to kind of give a little bit more of a rigorous overview for people that aren't really up to speed on electric cars and, and how they work. It's something that you've gotten used to at a gas station. You pull up, you put in the nozzle in the opening and you pull the trigger and maybe you set it for automatic stop when it's full and it just goes. And whether it takes 20 seconds or four or five minutes for a big truck, um, you don't really care. Um, it's fast enough. You uh, may run into the gas station and use the bathroom. Hopefully you didn't leave it while the pump was on. Um, but hopefully as soon as you're done pumping gas, you pull forward, you run into the gas station, 
use the bathroom, maybe you buy a $4 Coke, a snack, who knows. Um, if you're smart, hopefully, from time to time during your drive, you get out and walk a little bit so you don't get any blood clots uh, or anything getting weird because you sat down for eight hours on your drive. Get out every couple hours and walk around. If you're doing those things, the amount of time it charges to electri- uh, a charge an electric car can get really close to being the same. But let me start with the basics. From a general standpoint, there is three levels of charging. And I am bending some of the sem- semantics and the exact definitions of these things, but I'm trying to make it bite size for people that don't have any understanding how this works and how it works. So let me do this. Level one charging. That's your home wall outlet. That's where you plug in your hairdryer. That's where you plug in your microwave. That's where you plug in your laptop. It's where you plug in your everything. I mean, everything goes in the wall outlet. What, what, light bulbs, uh, lamps, um, your stereo, whatever. Your regular outlet, usually it's 15 amps to 20 amps. Usually it's 120 volts. And if you multiply the volts and the watts together, you can come up, I'm sorry, the volts and the amps together, you come up with watts. So let's make it really simple for me. If it's 120 volts and 10 amps, 120 times 10 is 1,200. The flow of energy, the watts, is 1.2. Over an hour, that would be 1.2 kilowatts. Another way to look at it, a light bulb that uses 100 watts of this power in your house over an hour will use uh, 100 kilowatt hour. I think I did that right. Yeah. And over 10 hours, it's 100 watt hour. And over 10 hours, it'll be one kilowatt hour. So that that's a light bulb, a, a bright light bulb on for 10 hours is one kilowatt of one kilowatt hour of energy. Your car battery, a small one can have a 50 kilowatt hour battery. A pretty good size one is a hundred or more. And some of the new trucks from Ford and Chevy, uh, they're going to have roughly 200 kilowatt hour batteries. So if you can pull about one kilowatt in an hour, one kilowatt hour, if your truck that has a 200 kilowatt hour battery is empty, It doesn't take you a whole lot of math to figure out. It's going to take a long fucking time to charge that battery from zero to full. Give or take 180 to 200 hours. It's a long time. Now, the wall outlet is not quite that low, so it won't be 180 hours. It'll only be like 150 hours. That's not going to work. That's not going to work for you. That's not going to work for me. So level one For most cars, unless you have overnight and you only drive 30, 50 miles a day and you have a really efficient car, that might work. But for most people, you're going to want to have access, whether it's in your home or on the street or at a restaurant or store. Movie theaters are now getting a lot of charging stations, one by me. I just drove up there for a laugh and uh, sat there for an hour getting free electricity and making phone calls for work and uh, added 25 miles of range to my car for free. That was kind of nice. Now, normally I won't be doing that, but you could. So if your budget was much tighter, uh, not only do you not buy gas, it might not even buy a whole lot of electricity. But the level two charger, depending on how efficient your car is, a lighter car can go farther on the same amount of electricity than a heavy car, just like it does with gasoline. This is not a new thing, hopefully, for you to understand. Um, A uh, level two charger at home for example, for my Chevy Bolt EV, it can take 32 amps at 240 volts. So the voltage doubles and the amps goes from 10 or 15, in my example before, to 32. You get up to a point of about 7.4 kilowatt. Over an hour, I can add 7.4 kilowatt hours of energy to the battery if it holds 60 kilowatt hours in total, adding seven per hour. You could be in the ballpark of eight to nine hours. The batteries always get slower to charge at the very top when they're almost full. So eight to nine hours to fully charge the car. Most nights, 
you didn't drain the car fully. You drove around, you did some errands. Uh, my car is rated for 260 miles of range, give or take. If I drive 100, I used about a third of the battery, maybe a little bit more than a third, 35% or something like that. And so I plug it in, in two or three hours, it's charged. It's full again. You can have settings. So if you are in an area where the electric rates are cheaper overnight, uh, you can charge your car. And in my case, uh, with the reduced rates overnight, it would cost me maybe 70 or 80 cents um, to put in enough electricity to drive roughly 36 miles. So 70 to 80 cents of electricity versus the four to five dollars you might be paying for gasoline. Keep that in mind. If you if you have the opportunity to get an electric car, it can save you a lot of money. You may not be in the position to do that at this time, but something to think about going forward. Some of the new bigger vehicles, uh, bigger battery vehicles, uh, test, some Teslas can do this already, but the trucks will do this and other vehicles will do this. They're not limited to 7.2, 7.4 kilowatt rate of charge at home. They might be able to do 9, 10, 11, maybe even 12. Now, your house may not be able to provide that much energy. If you're in a very old house with anything less than a 100 amp system already in the house, you're going to have a problem. You don't want to pump 60 amps or 70 amps of electricity to a truck on a system that can only handle 100 amps and then have your refrigerator and air conditioner kick on. It's not going to work for you. So you might have to upgrade. That can be very expensive. I get it. But for some people with modern homes that have 200 amp panels, you might be able to do more. Mine, we did um, a 50 amp breaker um, and then uh, planning on pulling at most 40 from the outlet and then the car takes 32. So there's always this 20% step down. But some of the newer cars, you might wanna run something like 80 amps to the car. And it might mean that you can't use the existing panel and you have to add another panel. And we can talk about several hundreds to a couple of thousands of dollars to do that. So just keep that in mind for really high speed charging. But for most people, for most vehicles, conventional level two is going to take care of it. Now, the next thing we have is what's called DC fast charging, DC direct current versus AC. Remember the band in the 70s and 80s, ACDC? Uh, they were probably talking about something else, but if from electricity, you have alternating current and direct current. Batteries run on direct current. Your house runs on alternating current. It's one of the problems with charging a car is you have to at some point have what's called a converter or an inverter that changes AC to DC. <clears throat> the nice thing is that with a DC fast charger, you can skip that. So with a DC fast charger, you're no longer talking about one or two uh, watts of power flow from an outlet. You're not talking seven to 15 to maybe 20 from a level two. You're talking about much bigger numbers. My car is a cheap electric car. It's an economical electric car. And to the best of my knowledge, it is uh, dollar for uh, mile driven the absolute cheapest electric car. Well, maybe it's the Leaf. No, no, actually it is the Bolt. The Bolt and of course they just had a price drop. Uh, the car starts at 25.6 for the 2023 model year. So maybe you could haggle on a 2022 or maybe save a little bit money on old ones. The problem is the demand is high enough because of how much money people save with these things that the used market is not really helping save you a lot of money. But I digress. So level three, some will dispute. There is no such thing as level three, whatever. For the sake of discussion, level three, DC, direct current, fast charging. My car will peak out the fastest rate it can handle is 55 kilowatt. Now, compared to the seven or 12 or 15 we we're talking before, clearly 55 is hella fast. With 55 kilowatt, I can add to my car something like 90 to 100 miles of range under ideal conditions uh, in 30 minutes. Now, if you're driving 300, 400 miles and you start with a full battery, 
that means somewhere along the way, you're going to probably have to stop for 30 or 40 minutes. It could be one stop. It could be two stops. Now, if you're driving 400 miles, you're probably taking six or seven hours to do it. So ideally what you do is you go through and get food somewhere, maybe a drive through because you're not eating well. You're on a road trip. You get your food and then you find the plug. You plug in the car while you sit in your car for 15 to 20 minutes to eat the food. If the uh, the charger is at a, a mall or a gas station, maybe you go inside and again, buy a, a $4 Coke or use a bathroom or whatever. And yes, your stop wasn't just 10 minutes like it could have been for gasoline. It's 20 or 30. If you do that every day, this kind of car might not be a good fit for you. And again, like I said, that's part of why it's such an affordable car. It doesn't have a huge battery. They're expensive. It doesn't charge super fast. That's expensive. You have to upgrade the equipment and all those things. Now, there are cars coming out like Kia, uh, the Mustang. Of course, Teslas can already do this. Uh, that will charge at 100, uh, 155 or more. It is believed that the Ford Lightning and the Chevy Silverado Electric, as well as uh, some other high-end cars, and again, uh, many of the high-end Teslas can charge faster. We're talking cars about eighty, a hundred, hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars. The the trucks might be able to charge this fast for forty to sixty. Again, still out of the price range for a lot of people. Hopefully, uh, as we continue to get cheaper batteries, you would be able to get a new car for twenty-five to thirty thousand dollars that can charge a little faster. If you get something that charges at 150 or 160 kilowatt as an example with my car in 30 minutes i could get 90 miles 90 to 100 miles now you're talking about in 10 minutes getting 90 to 100 miles if you stretch that out to 20 minutes of course you're talking about possibly 180 to 200 miles in 20 minutes so that means a 20 minute stop would allow you to drive up to three more hours. So if you can drive three hours, well, maybe four or five hours on the initial charge that you had from home and then stop for 20 minutes and then drive for another 200 miles, another three hours, you're now talking about going 500 miles, give or take, with only a single stop of 20 minutes to charge your car. Is that as fast as gasoline? No. Is it so close that it doesn't materially matter? Yes. It's so close it doesn't materially matter. We are there. Those cars exist and you can buy them today. They're just kind of expensive. So we, we've got to work on getting those prices down. But it's just around the corner. The next thing that people have issues with, and they should, uh, is often called range anxiety. I think this is mis misnamed. I don't have range anxiety with my car. I know how far it can go in under different conditions. The temp, if it's really cold, it doesn't go as far. If you go really fast, it doesn't go as far. If you drive into a headwind, it doesn't go as far. If you run the air conditioning or the heat, it doesn't go as far. These same conditions will affect the performance of your gasoline powered car. You just don't notice it because it doesn't fucking matter to you. You don't have a thing on the dash telling you exactly how many miles, well, some cars do, um, but it doesn't generally matter. And if you use up too much gasoline, you stop for 10 minutes and you add gasoline. So on some of these newer electric cars, you stop for 20 minutes and you add electricity. So the range is not the concern. The anxiety, what I call it, is charging anxiety. As an example, since I live in the Chicago suburbs, if I drive from my house to Champaign, Illinois, where I used to live, and we have friends and people that we know there, and back, before I got my battery upgrade, I did it once under ideal conditions using state roads, not the interstate, and I could get there and back, but barely. Another time when we took the interstate, it required us to charge for three hours at a level two charger. That's a buzzkill. Now, the thing is, we knew that in advance. We planned for that in advance, and we had a nice long dinner and enjoyed ourselves and visited with some friends while the car was charging, and we drove back. Not a big deal. The battery upgrade I got in my car now gets me 20 more miles of range. So that helps an awful lot. And between me and uh, Champagne now is a brand new 
DC fast charger. It's not screaming fast. I think it's a 62. My car can only peak out at 55. So it's going to work for my car. But I could stop there for 15 minutes, add 45 miles of driving distance to my car. And now going down to Champaign and back is easy peasy. There is two different uh, chargers, DC fast chargers that are being added to Champaign. So that'll help. Uh, by the way, the, the new one on the way is in a city called uh, Bourbonnais, Illinois, Bourbonnais, Kankakee, and it's being put in by a Hyundai dealership. Apparently, Hyundai is either asking or requiring all of the dealerships to put in really nice DC fast charging stations. So that's a big perk. Um, the number of locations for DC fast chargers, uh, I interestingly, is about three to four times as many locations as there are Tesla stations. Tesla stations are usually bigger, but if you want to buy an electric car and you can't charge from home, you want the charger to be uh, closer to you, not bigger. You don't care if there's only one in all of Champaign-Urbana. You could have four of them and go to the one that's close to you, and you would actually save time even if your car didn't charge quite as fast and likely uh, the newer models are going to charge just as fast or not faster than Tesla's. So anyway, that's just kind of some thoughts on that. Of course, uh, like I said, a, a lighter vehicle can get four miles per kilowatt. A really heavy vehicle like the Hummer or the Tesla truck um, might get two miles for a kilowatt of energy. So keep that in mind. The efficiency matters. The rate of flow matters. Uh, people often ask, what does it char cost to charge at the DC fast chargers? I can't address Tesla costs. Um, but for me at home, uh, if I'm on the uh, overnight rate, it's maybe I'll, I'll make this equivalent to the amount of energy in, in a gallon of gasoline uh, on a discounted rate, maybe 80 cents uh, on a normal rate, a dollar 10 to a dollar 20 at a DC fast charger. It might be two to three to three and a half dollars. But if the vast majority of your driving, like most normal human beings is around town, you're only going to do that occasionally. And it's still most of the time, and especially now, cheaper than gasoline anyway. Um, the other thing that you can get with electric cars that you cannot get with a gasoline car is all of the free stations. Very rarely is a fast DC fast charging level three station free. But like I said earlier, a lot of times level two stations at grocery stores, restaurants, um, theaters, they're often free. So if you go to see a movie, uh, go early because there might be too much demand. I mean, too many cars want to charge. But if you go to an early movie, you plug in your car, you charge for three hours. If it's relatively efficient, you added 75 miles of range for free while you're watching a movie. So check some of those things out. Let me know uh, how it's working for you or if you have any other questions about electric cars. Send me an email, phil at polarisfinancialplanning.com. Um, I'm going to cut it there because it's already longer than I wanted, but that's okay. We had great fun. I'll talk to you another time until I see you in person. Ciao.